Um, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, the Frank Bratchy Studio for Creative Inquiry for hosting this space, and uh, of course, uh, Center for Arts and Society for hosting this event. Um, Scott and I are the artistic directors to a project called The Drift, which actually started when we were uh, MFA students here at Carnegie Mellon. And we're an artist-run organization that uh, creates temporary public art projects on the Three Rivers in Pittsburgh, PA, and elsewhere. And we're really excited to um, be working with Michael Jones McKeon for um, a public project um, slated for some time next year. Um, and we're really excited to uh, have him here today to talk about his work and sort of introduce his very interesting practice. Scott, did you want to say something? I think he covered it all. Okay. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, bring up yeah. Michael. Thanks. Cool. Okay. So uh, thanks for thanks for coming out tonight. Um, it's uh, pretty amazing to be here. This is um, you know the studio for creative inquiry. It's like uh, it occupies a pretty large chunk of mental real estate, I think, for a lot of people um, and a lot of people's imagination about what happens here. So it was actually quite interesting to walk into the room. They're like, here it is. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty nice to do that. Um, and um, is it OK? It's good. Yeah, I'm a little taller. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I. I want to thank the I want to thank the Drift. I want to thank the Center for Arts and Society and Carnegie Mellon, the Studio for Creative Inquiry. It's um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some projects that I've worked on over the last few years. Um, and when I, I should say that I'm um, I'm a sculptor. I think of myself in a really um, uh, in a careful way as a as a sculptor. But also in a really non um, anachronistic way, I think. Um, I so when so when this this concept, this heading, this sort of this idea of performance, this sort of umbrella category, this umbre umbrella theme, was like dropped on my work. It was an interesting opportunity to think through some uh, some nascent concepts that I've been thinking about for a while and try to bring some form to them. So it's I'm going to talk about some things that um, I haven't really talked about before. So I want to apologize from the beginning if I spend some time wading through some, some concepts that uh, they might not even be that clear to me at this moment. So with that said, also, if you have any questions while I'm talking, it's actually very it's very helpful for me that it helps me find my way sometimes if uh, if someone throws up a hand and has a question it's actually really it's actually really great to know people are, are there so um, the the project that that I thought I'd start out with is um, the one that was mentioned and it was a project that I started in 2002 um, working on working on some tests and the, the the project, the concept was quite simple. It was like I want to I want to make a rainbow uh, over top of a building. And what happened was is is it took about ten years to actually realize realize that because of various um, various problems that I gave myself to solve. So one of them, one of them was um, a reliance on uh, a completely sustainable, self-continuing um, system. So a kind, of a kind of a closed system in some ways that relied on rainwater um, and natural sunlight. And so that started a series of questions over, over many, many years to try to solve. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about it technically, but I want to talk mostly about about it um, conceptually and philosophically. Um, and then I'll, later on, I'll talk a little bit how it ties into some uh, some other more 
more uh, object-oriented sculpture, sculptural works. But one of the problems I had, that I had um, encountered was this idea um, around time in, in the way that uh, a sculpture operates. So uh, for years and years, I was, I was kind of struggling with, um, with the way that, with the way that um, one, I was, I was working on a, in, uh, in sort of a theatrical vein, making like uh, stages and making props and thinking about narration and thinking about the possibility that a sculpture could, could uh, actually convey, convey narrative meanings. But also thinking about a sculpture as a, as a, as a device that kind of lacks, lacks a kind of time. So when you when you watch a film or when you read a book, there's there's a discrete origin point and there's a there's a there's a totalitizing conclusion and there's all the things that happen inside of that. And that takes time. And it's a it's a very it's a it's an awesome quantity. But with the sculpture, it's a, as you walk into the room, you could you could argue that that's the, the beginning, and when you leave the room, that's the end. But it doesn't it doesn't quite behave the way that we're we're becoming more and more well versed in. So we're we're exceedingly well versed in understanding kind of narrative arcs that have that have time in them. So think about like YouTube videos, or think about uh, news clips, or think about like clickbait mostly, and think about. Um, Newspaper articles, like everything, has a kind of time quotient in it, but a sculpture kind of s just stays there. It's sort of like a dumb entity, and that was kind of exciting to me, and it still is very exciting to me. But it's also very frustrating to try to figure out how do you get objects to mean things, like how do you get them to perform, and that's a little bit about the topic of the, the topic of the day: this idea of performance. Performance. So, in thinking about time. I was trying to imagine, uh, I was trying to imagine objects that, or I was working with objects that that held time in a very specific way. So, and I'll, I'll show some more images of of, uh, of other works that will make this will all make sense kind of retroactively. But like thinking about the ways that um, kind of like a contemporary archaeology, or thinking about um, the way that a cell phone holds a very specific kind of time. So. Like if we, if I were to pass like my iPhone six around, and we were to look at it next to like an iPhone four, there would be an immense amount of time, like galaxy, like light years, uh, between these two these two devices that are actually quite similar, but the a cell phone holds time in a very particular way, like very different than say like an Arrowhead or like a Windsor chair, um, that that are sort of like copies of copies of copies that we don't really quite know how they hold time. Or a mountain that sort of like is slowly, it's sort of succumbing to geological forces and it's moving slowly, but we register to our bodies and our uh, phenomenologically, it's like we can't understand it moving, so it doesn't seem to obey time. But then I came across this idea, uh, the rainbow, as a kind of as a kind of form that was frozen, so as a kind of um, as a kind of constant in some way. And that became really interesting to me um, conceptually and philosophically, like this idea of like uh, a form that was somehow not fixed in time, that it somehow was a time traveler, that it somehow lived in some other plane of omniscience, that it didn't really um, care about us in some ways, that it sort of, um, it floated in some, in some ether space. And that was, um, a way into the project for me, a way, uh, a kind of, a road into a whole set of uh, questions about what the rainbow was, or how it related to objects, or time, or deep time, what deep time was. So I thought, um, I'd just show a quick video so you can see how it operates. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I was working technically. It was, um, it was actually quite simple the, in some way. Um, you have the, this was in um, uh, 
downtown Nebraska at this residency center called the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art. And the essentially the building became became a sculpture, became a meta sculpture. So the there was a series of tanks that were installed um, that caught the spring rain for about three months leading up to the project. So all of the rain that fell on top of the roof was collected and was filtered and was stored in a series of tanks. So that was the first stage. And then um, from there, there was a series of um, machines that were placed inside of the building that were able to, to do some of the work. There was a large uh, 60 horsepower turbine pump that pressurized the water that, that then delivered it back to the roof to a series of these specialized nozzles that shoot the, the water up into the air, but also atomize it in such a in such a way as to break the water apart to create this this water cloud. Um, there was a some like a UV filter that filtered the water, so it was kind of a it was kind of a a pretty in some ways when you saw the setup it was it was pretty sophisticated, but in other ways it's it was it's pretty. It's pretty plain, but the central concept was to think of to think of the building as some kind of uh, of some kind of machine. So the way that it worked was um, uh, again more technically the the there's a there's a kind of sacred geometry that allows a rainbow to happen, and it's a fix it's a fixed angle, um, and so if there's if there's a prism or water droplets that appear at a specific um, place in the sky, and if the sun is in a specific place in the sky, and if your body is placed in direct orientation to to that water cloud or that water wall in the sun, you'll see you'll see the rainbow. So the the idea was to kind of um, regulate that to allow that to occur twice a day. So once in the morning and then once in the evening. So this would happen. Um, around 15 to 20 minutes um, uh, in the morning and then again in the evening. So you can see, you can see here, like um, these are some of the tanks that were installed inside of the building. These are pretty massive, like here's like an SUV. So you can kind of see the, um, the size of these things. They're about 18 feet tall. Um, each one held about 12,000 gallons of water. So it was, um, it was this, uh, Kind of a technological feat in some way, and you could see that this water was collected, and then it sort of raced, raced on the side of the building to another tank where this was stored for each rainbow event. And there was another tank inside of the, inside of the building. One of the things, part of, part of, um, part of the idea of performance. I mean, there's. I want to talk about performance in a few different ways tonight, and one of them. One of them is the is the the performative the performative things that happen when you're um, when you're working on something, and the the piece the piece required required an immense amount of logistical uh, hurdling, and so there's the space of kind of negotiation, and there's the space of explaining, and there's the space of kind of um, courting. There's the space of um, kind of flirting and, and getting people to essentially understand what you're working on. But in this particular case, there was, no, there was never a, a physical object to show them. It's like part of the reason that the project took so long to achieve was because you could never show anyone the rainbow. You had to kind of get them to believe that it could exist and to convince many, many people that it would work to then make it work. So it was kind of like reverse engineering the whole process of making like a maquette or something. I did, I'd actually did make some maquettes, but it was still, uh, it ended up being um, uh, still a lot of hurdling that happened. So there was this, um, there was this thing in the gallery that happened as well, like I, I mentioned. So there was these, um, lots of these pipes that came through. So I brought some of the elements into the, into the gallery space. There were these photo drop, Photographic backdrops that were that were in the space. You can see two here. Um, there's this UV filter that I said that would filter out the um, would filter the water to make it essentially potable, drinkable. 
um, this sort of turbine pump that, that pressurized the water, like I mentioned. And I also wanted to bring in a couple, um, a few other objects. So there was, it was important that the, it was important that the rainbow um, existed in relation to um, objects that held different kinds of time signatures to begin some kind of discussion, some kind of poem, like long form poem about uh, objects in time. So I chose a few, I chose a few objects that had really um, specific time registrations. Like one is this, uh, is this shell um, on the left hand side from um, uh, Micronesia, from uh, an island near where I was born. The, the blanket on the right is, a, is a, a blanket from about 19, uh, 1880 uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, near where my grandparents were born on my mother's side. And um, there was this uh, white light emitter that was on this, all of this was on this modernist, uh, Danish modern table. Um, this white light emitter that shined through a prism that would give this uh, perpetual, perpetual uh, rainbow in the back of this photographic light stand. And there was a large, um, the one on the right is this large 110 pound uh, meteorite that um, fell in, in Argentina about 5,000 years ago. And then finally there was, um, there was a bristol cone pine tree that was um, on a mountaintop in Colorado that was dug up and brought to, to Omaha. So you had uh, the bristol cone pine is the oldest living, um, the oldest living organism on the planet. So the oldest living thing on the planet it has the DNA to be the oldest living living thing. So there's, there's bristol cones that are believed to be 5,000 years old. So there was some, some kind of um, interesting relationship with this li like a living entity that had the capacity to, to outlive everything. Um, and then thinking about like a, a meteorite. So there's a few objects on the planet that are, that are kind of amazingly older than the Earth itself. So somehow like the, the surface that we live on is populated with a few fragments that are older than itself. So it's like somehow this anomaly, this sort of rogue shape that <clears throat> that has this other um, this other timeline to it, and then a blanket, something that like you know there's books and books of in the library, and there's connoisseurs of people that that can understand these quilts and tell us about its provenance and tell us beautiful things about you know who made it and where they made it and which county. You know, was it Lancaster or someplace in Ohio or something beautiful about these these quilts? So some very specific time registration, and then this shell, this thing stuck in some kind of slowly evolving um, time time place. So all of that, and then periodically, this rainbow would appear over top of the building that that fit, that was fixed to time in some different way. So you can see it's this uh, was a really long. Uh, way of thinking about uh, a very basic, very basic philosophical concept. And then the, the bristlecone was watered on a, um, on a drip from the water that created the rainbow. So there was some, some, uh, some loop in with all of these objects that sort of loop back to, to, this, to this living thing. So I thought I would show some other works, and then I'm going to try to weave a few things together, and hopefully they, they begin to make sense. Um, you know, there's um, one one concept that's uh, pretty important to talk about is um, is the concept of uh, deanthropomorphism, and I think this is a really interesting term in relation to performance. Um, and it's something that I'm really curious about in relation to objects. So the concept of deanthropomorphism is essentially it's like we're um, we're decentering ourselves from from a kind of the locus of of the universe. So we're sort of like the cent we're, uh traditionally we've always thought about or classically we've thought about ourselves as the center of the universe. So it's like at one point, the earth was the center of the universe and the sun went around the earth and then everything happened around us. 
and then slowly, you know, obviously through scientific advances, it's like we start to realize it's like, okay, well, we're not the center of our solar system, but we must be the center of the universe still. You know, we're still, that's happening. So we're slowly in this creep of um, understanding that we're just another thing. Like we're not, we're not particularly important. And this is, um, this is this concept of, of deanthropomorphism. So um, this is happening on many, many, many fronts, it seems like. And there's some kind of awesome convergence that's, that's, uh, that's happening where we're beginning to understand ourselves in a very, very different way. And it's something that I'm pretty excited about. Um, and I think it has a huge, huge potential to, um, in sculpture and in art making, but also in more socio-political sense. And that's something I'll try to talk about a little bit. So like one, one thing, for instance, is, um, is uh, there's, a really, there's a really special, probably the most important photograph um, ever taken was the, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field photograph. Do you guys know about this one? The Hubble, the Hubble Ultra, Deep, Ultra Deep Field photograph was um, this photograph that was taken by the Hubble telescope that essentially aimed, essentially it aimed itself at a, a part of, a very, very small part of the, the night sky. So you can imagine like holding up maybe like a, like a pencil at arm's length and the eraser head, the eraser head might be the section that Hubble looked at, but even smaller than that. And so it, it, it photographed that section of the sky for, um, for days and days and days and days. And we didn't really know what was going to happen, but um, when the exposure was complete, um, 100,000 new galaxies emerged. And like in each galaxy, there's billions of stars. So it was this issue of like, this is a moment of understand, like a radical shift potentially occurs where we think about ourselves as something special or as, as singular. Um, and then suddenly, suddenly the, the ultra deep field photograph comes out and it's like the universe expands exponentially um, in some kind of like, uh, in some kind of like deep, like Borges kind of like, like deep, deep space, you know, library of Babel kind of infinite space. And we, so I'm really, I was really curious about this photograph and spent a lot of time thinking about this photograph and there's some works that have emerged from it. But it's, in some ways it crystallizes this idea really, really closely, really, really well. So I'm gonna show some other images of some other projects. Uh, this was a, a show this summer in Miami. There's, um, in relation to, in relation to this idea of like uh, the anthropomorphism, there's something starts to happen in relation to how we view objects that I'm really uh, interested in and spend a lot of time worrying about in a in a really uh, not in the pejorative sense, but worrying about in the studio. And one of them, one of them is it's like we. Um, if so, are you guys familiar with this term animism? Some people maybe animism. It's sort of like um, it's like if you it's actually a really out of favor um, concept. It's a really old fashioned concept that that somehow in objects there's a there's a spirit, there's some kind of there's some kind of ghost in the machine somehow, and this was kind of um, you know. When we when we didn't have a kind of sophisticated understanding about about what objects were and how deep they how deep they are how how when we penetrate the meniscus surface of them they it's not just it doesn't keep it's not just pizza all the way through you know it's not just the flip flop all the way through at a moment at a certain moment it breaks into other particles 
and we start to we start to understand like there well there's no there's no ghost inside of there there's no there's no spirit force inside inside of my up boot you know it's it's just the, it's just that so but something else has happened um, so in some ways we've demystified certain certain uh, certain properties like really ancient kind of properties that we once maybe associated with um, with certain kinds of objects um, you know like walking into the forest and like there's a kind of immense uh, mystery when you walk into the forest and you can um, if you're in the right headspace or in, you're on the right drugs you could really start to get pretty freaky in the forest and uh, start to understand something about the forest, but and this is sort of like an animistic idea that there's some there's some spirit force there. But something really interesting has occurred where, like through the back door, if we rediagram um, some of these ideas in a scientific sense, we're starting to understand that it's like um, there's um, there's something else there, and this happened. This has something to do with shifting shifting a, a perception of a mind. A mind-dependent universe, so a universe that's dependent on our thought, like human thought, and a mind-independent universe, like some, a universe that's not dependent on our construction of reality. It just exists. So we have a we, there's there's immense there's immense studies about like the intelligence of plants right now. Like we're trying to figure out like um, you know our plants do like how do plants think, and we're we're coming to figure. We're coming to find out. Like, well, they're actually highly intelligent. Um, they actually, they actually learn. Um, you know, how do forests think? Are there, are they, are they actually thinking, thinking entities? Um, and we're, we're slowly figuring out that, in some, in some sense, yes, not in the mind-dependent way that we understand it, in the human way that we understand it, but in a completely different sense. Um, so this has something to do with the anthropomorphism as well. Like. This, uh, as we sort of break break the kind of hierarchy from the way that we can script the world and we kind of de we sort of decouple it from from our own wants and desires we start to see some stranger world emerge there's also this there's also something to say about this in relation to the way the way that we are right now and what I mean by that is, so if we were to take the, the concept of animism, if we were to take the concept that that uh, that there's there's something there's a spirit in the in the in the object, um, and we were to think about it in terms of say like some people might say like a techno animism, so the idea that the idea that um, like in the room right now with us are Wi-Fi signals, or in the room right, right now are like dozens of different satellite signals that are that are enabling us to receive um, massive amounts of information. Um, in some in some techno techno animistic sense, there's there's another spirit in the room with us. There's like this invisible there's this invisible thing that's happening. So we and this is happening at every single second of the day with us in different in different ways. Like the way that we count on our world to work. Has something to do with these invisible forces, um, and this has something. This has, I think, something to do with um, the way that we were we're retraining ourselves to think about objects. So, if we live in a world like if we live in an object-oriented world, so it's like just think about this room as an example of like the diversity of materials and substances and objects that are in the room with us. It's kind of like unbelievably. It's like unimaginable actually to think about all of all of the substances that are here with us um, but in another sense it's like as we live in this object-oriented world as we live in this material-based world we're we're toggling like more more and more effortlessly to screen-based environments so to see representations of these of these things to the point where it's like you know if we were to ask if we were to ask our past selves like 15 years ago if we were if we would ever, you know, buy the things that we buy on Amazon.com, we'd be like, no way, I need to go to the store, I need to handle it, like, I need to sort of, like, have this kind of, you know, we trust our Prime account to deliver us things, 
and they emerge, they come to our door, and they don't even seem made. They don't even seem like they were they were they were made. They just they just arrive, <laughs> and then when we're done with them, they disappear. They go away, and it's like our relationship with objects have changed immensely this way. It's like they they appear in our lives. We use them until we don't use them, and then they disappear. And the the concept of how an object comes to be and how an object uh, the, is is born and 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 is delivered and uh, has a relationship to a copper mine in Chile or has a relationship to uh, a coal mine uh, somewhere in China or has a relationship to um, the trade winds. It's like we all of these things become related. Uh, relatable in in some kind of meta material sense, like how how the how our world of material objects like are are fixed in some massively complicated network. So this object, um, uh, you know, there was this color component, and there was this kind of like field of like undulating, almost like screensaver colors, and then there was this black, this black. Uh, dense thing of um, just like a reflective um, graphite material and the materials list in a lot of these um, these pieces were uh, pretty dense and it's something that I've been playing with for a while so a work like sorry to go back so fast a work like this um, are, there's a there's a kind of visible material set where it might be like wood or paint or um, plaster or resin or um, you know, uh, prosthetic silicone or hair, makeup, things like that. And then there's a there's a hidden away material set um, that that it that lives in a withdrawn way that lives that lives separated from from our a retinal a retinal kind of display. So in this one there was um, there was a group of of meteorites from that fell around the Earth from 50,000 years ago up until about a year ago. So in each one of these, um, let me just scroll forward. In each one of these plants was in, was embedded a, a meteorite. So there was a meteorite from China, and there was a meteorite um, um, from northern Africa, and there was a meteorite from the Philippines. So meteorite falls from all around the Earth from, at various different times, and embedded inside of these. Um, strange strange shadow versions of, of plant life in this one in this show this it was playing on this concept of belief in some way or the way that the ways that materials can kind of um, can be shy or can can hide away or can withdraw from us or thinking about the ways that you know when I press when I press my like when I turn my computer on or turn it on from from sleep, like a million things happen that that are that are happening, but most of them are invisible for me. Most of them most of them happen intentionally in some other realm of omniscience. So thinking about the ways in which this is occurring and trying to draw some kind of metaphor towards that in the work. So this one had um, a number a number of um, sort of psychostimulants. That were that were placed inside of this this broken arm, so the list was quite long of of, of various kinds of uh, psychotropic um, drugs. I have a, a question. Oh yeah, please just dive in. Um, you talked in the beginning about uh, seeing yourself as kind of a traditional sculptor, and then you talked a second ago about how things arrive from Amazon as if they're not made. And I, I'm getting a little bit of disconnect in your own work, how I don't really know how things are made or constructed or the materials you've alluded to graphite, um, but they're, I understand you want them to appear as if they just kind of came made, but I was hoping you could talk about your process a little bit as well. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, my process is really loopy. You know, it's, um, you know, I think it, it's, um, like if you were to go, if you were to go into my studio, you would see a lot of the a lot of things getting made, um, and the way they get made sometimes is um, is pretty it's pretty basic, you know. Like there's mold making, there's kind of like 
like direct direct modeling. It's like welding, woodworking, um, uh, airbrushes, automotive paint, resin. Like there's a kind of a, it would almost feel like maybe um, more like a, like a theater, like a theater uh, studio in the, in the diversity of approaches just to make something. Um, so there is this idea of representation that runs through the work a lot. So the, the and I think I have a, I have a lot, uh, I have a lot to say about that. And I think one, one of them is, um, one of them is something, has something to do with resistance to Duchamp always winning. And it's like, if there's a if there's a moment where where a real object can enter it can sort of enter the arena and and to work to work as an art object and that becomes that becomes a kind of um, uh, I think if you were to ask my students say for instance it's the most common uh, approach to sort of like shop on eBay you know find the thing that you want bring it in and like point to it. There's there's this something something gets lost in its in its in in the possibility for it to, to make metaphor in in the way that I think I think it's still possible to do. So there, what's happened is is there's a lot of different kinds of representation. Like say for instance the rainbow. Like the rainbow has a has a very strange relationship to being a ready-made, simultaneously a ready-made and simultaneously a representation. Like it's a fabrication, it's like a figment, but it's also it's also a ready-made. It's also a real a real thing. So the ways I think we're um, I think we're at this really strange point right now where we can where we can get anything we want delivered to our door in 24 hours. And as as artists, and particularly for me, like as a sculptor. The possibility of having um, having human hair delivered to my doorstep, and not just like um, any human hair, but I could choose the color. Um, I can I can look in the provenance, and I can figure out exactly who, what kind of hair I want delivered to me, um, and it will come it will come the next day. And so if we if if we live in the world where any anything you can possibly imagine can be delivered to your door. It, it changes our relationship to materiality. So I'm. This is a long way of thinking about how one processes an image. Is it important to to think about the the way that one can process an image? So, I um, I think it's a great question, and it's something that I don't really fetishize so much about. Like I don't think a lot about. Um, uh, I don't think a lot about. I do think I don't. I don't want to say that because I spend a lot of time worried, like losing sleep over how things get made. But I, I typically don't bring that into the gallery with me. Like things, things don't work. Uh, I'm not fetishizing like a, like a finish as a, as a as something that I want folks to focus on. It's almost like I, I fetishize on a finish so if people don't focus on it. It's almost like um, it's like if you were to watch a. I'm gonna keep moving slides around. If you were to watch a, a film, this is a real sidebar now. But if you were to watch a film, and it's like, like say, say you were watching like Brokeback Mountain. Have you guys ever seen Brokeback Mountain? It's like yes. this, like say, like I don't know. I've watched this a couple times, and it just like gets me. It's like it just really gets me. And so I'm, <laughs> so I watch Brokeback Mountain, you know. And if the reason that the reason that we we can become emotional. With a movie like this, it's because um, Ang Lee got everything right. Like he he didn't, you know. There is a scene, and you know, if the light boom like entered entered into the scene, like all of a sudden we would know it was a fiction. All of a sudden we would say, like, oh, like we, it would ruin it would ruin the kind of the psychological makeup that he had spent so long um, to get us into. So it's like there's so many things that you have to get right, so you don't this, so you don't think about it. Like you don't want to think about the lighting, you know, especially the lighting source. So I don't know. I think about that a lot sometimes in the studio in the ways I'm processing things of like.
how can I how can I render something to a point where it doesn't become um, it's not something you think about. Does anyone else have any questions? That was a great one. Do you think you're successful at that? Mm. What was the question? Oh, uh, yeah, the question was, do, you, do I think I'm successful at that? Um, probably not. I mean, it's probably like one of those things that you could just keep working on. Um, and, and it's, you know, the way I describe it, it's not so simple. I mean, because there's moments, there's moments about velocity, you know, where you want, you, it can't just all be one speed. Like, there has to be moments where it's like, like, say for instance, like, you know the work on the on the right here. There's many many different speeds in that in that piece. So it's like, you know, there's the speed of like trying to get a trying to get a gradient right. You know, of like sanding and sanding and sanding. But like I don't want you to think about the sanding. I just want you to think about a gradient. Um, and then there's like the moment of like making, uh, you know, grabbing people off the street to take like fake, um, you know stock photography, you know, like, well, I don't really want you to think about stock photography, like, that I, that I ask people to hold objects, you know, but I needed people to hold certain objects to get, to get those photographs, you know. Um, so there's the speed of that, which is actually quite slow, and then, you know, there's this, like, weird cave painting, like, drawing on it that's, like, made with a uh, rescue sea, rescue sea, uh, rescue dive. If you get lost at sea, you would spill this dive in the ocean. And it's kind of like just drunken and like handled, like you're kind of talking on the phone when you're when you're doing it. So there's lots of different velocities in the work that I'm that I'm interested in. So for a long time, I was, um, uh, I'm still working on a lot, of, a lot of sculptures that have to do with um, an idea around uh, uh, display. And, and uh, some, of it, some of it rendered itself around like, um, uh, what would you say, like, like, like theatrical, theatrical associations, like stages. Uh, there's going to be some in a, little, in a few minutes. Um, and some of them are more um, like uh, uh, like shop display or or archaeological display. Um, I've got a question. Yeah, please. I was wondering what if you could describe how the ideal viewer would interact with your work. Describe how the ideal viewer would interact with the work. That's a really great question. Um, you know. I think um, it ch well, it changes. It changes piece to piece. Um, well, not piece to piece, but I would say like a piece like the rainbow, for instance. Uh, there was a real different kind of um, engagement that that happened with that piece, and it's, I'm glad you bring that up because it's it's maybe important to circle back to that. Um, so. There's, like in that piece, it was important to think about the way that was there was there a way to make to make a okay I'm gonna go back just a, few, a, a little bit a little bit into the past so I was struggling for a long time with how to make a, a public sculpture so I was I was thinking about I was making a lot of gallery works and museum works and I was thinking like well how do how can I make a public public sculpture. And what happened was is, is that um, I was thinking about it all wrong. And I was thinking, I was thinking about that exactly that, like the the genre of public of public art. And in that genre, like in a, this is a gross generalization, but in that genre there's a there's a kind of there's a there's a certain kind of engagement that 
that, uh, that the work predicts. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't get it right. So what happened was, and this happened through the back door with, with the Rainbow Project, it actually kind of morphed into a, into a civic artwork where, where the, the, the work's engagement with the, with the public changed. So there was um, the making of it, of bringing more and more people involved. Like um, all of a sudden there was like, um, it wasn't just me and a curator and a preparator, it was like, you know, civil engineers and there was like, um, it was like atmospheric scientists and there was like um, landscape architects and there was rainwater harvesters and there was the mayor and there was like, there was all of these people and people were flying in to study the piece and all of a sudden there was a drought and all of a sudden it was the worst drought in the, in the, in the Midwest, like people were losing their farms and in the middle of this huge drought there was this crazy rainbow that was, that was flowing in the middle of the city, you know, and there was massive misunderstanding about like, can you believe they're wasting this water in the drought? Like, these crazy, crazy artists, like there was like people, there was like, you know, people were picketing, it's like, save water, no rainbow, they had like, <laughs> you know, and like, and then slowly we had this, we, there was a campaign that they put out to sort of like, no, 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 you have to understand, this is like, this is the most progressive use of water you can imagine, this is the way that we all should be using water, it's like, we have all of this water that just, it becomes, becomes, goes down the drain. Essentially, there's a way to harvest this water, so we wouldn't be having this problem at all right now. So it's like there is a whole discussion around around um, uh, around rain conservation and water conservation. So you know, and then meanwhile, it's like you have people showing up to the rainbow events, and you know, there you know you have some people that are just like taking selfies with the rainbow, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm next to this woman, and she's like, you know. I, I drove 100 miles, um, and my husband just died, and this felt really important to do. And then you're sitting next to someone else, and you know they have like a uh, they have a, a pride flag on their shirt, and you're sort of like, wow, this is really weird. You have someone else who's reading scripture, you know, thinking about Noah and thinking of, and it's like, it's so it's kind of like, wow, this is this is really crazy, and so. Through the back door, the the idea of what is how to make a civics a civic artwork started to emerge for me, like what that what that meant, and it was just it's maybe it's maybe like a, a semantic, but somehow it was important to make that shift in thinking about um, you know public art as a genre and this other kind of artwork that could that could actually do something that could actually move things, and and uh, so that is a roundabout way of talking about how I, like an ideal audience, or like a, how I want people to, to use the work in that, in that particular kind of project. Well, but people are going to interact with that, the, the rainbow project, like a lot differently than they are at least. Can you talk about the ideal viewers? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, for me, it's, you know, I, like when I first started talking about the rainbow, like the problems, the problems that I was uh, addressing had were the same problems that I think some of these are addressing. You know, um, ideas around objects, ideas around like how certain objects hold time, um, and so in some ways the the rainbow project was this very um, elaborate way of dealing with the set of problems that I had been dealing with in in, in gallery-based work, but in with, through with a really different DNA a totally different genetic makeup. Um, so in, in works like this, it's maybe it, it's uh, it's kind of more straightforward in some ways. It's like they live they live in um, they live in white cubes. You know, they they they're they're objects that are not to be touched. They're they're not to be they're not to be handled. They they live in some kind of other in other in other uh, in a more classic classic way like art objects. And I'm I'm totally I'm totally comfortable with that. So like um, so you saw a really fast uh, spread of 
of some different kinds of projects, some smaller, some smaller projects, some much larger um, projects. And you know, I think there's there's oftentimes there's a lot of there's a lot of projects that are that are writing parallel to those those works that are getting shown in galleries and museums and things like that. Um, so I thought to show a couple of those, and I don't. In some ways, I don't even know what to do with these. They they live. Um, they're fi I think of them as finished artworks, but they they address this idea of audience in some in some different sense. So um, in this one, uh, I started thinking about. Well, I was thinking about the earth, and I was thinking about the earth as a as an object, and thinking about ways of measuring it. This is an older project. It started in two thousand four and thinking about ways of measuring it. And at this point, we, we were just starting to get, um, we were just starting to uh, get a clearer and clearer picture about the, the Earth map from satellite. So we had um, elevations uh, throughout the ocean. We had elevations pretty much like every meter on the, on the planet. So we had these massive, massive um, stockpiles of data about the surface of the Earth. And so I, I tried to figure out exactly how big the Earth was. Like if I could if I could if I could draw a line around the Earth, would there be one that was the longest? And would that describe a limit? Would that describe somehow a global limit? And this was um, you know a really classic idea around. I had been doing some projects I raced through about exploration and about um, manifest destiny and about um, evil evil things that we had done to each other in relation to expansionism. And so this one was some was running parallel to that this idea about circumnavigation and 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 humans trying to understand the the, the ball that they live on, and so to try to expand that uh, a little bit to try to think about is there some way to measure the Earth in its to to understand a global limit. So I took all the all the data and, and ran it through um, a computer array, and it came out with the longest possible line. And so while I was working on that one, I was thinking about um, circumnavigators, like people that people that had tried to that had successfully circumnavigated the Earth, but but also had unsuccessfully circumnavigated the Earth. And I found I came across this guy um, Donald Crowhurst, who um, was uh, was famous for a while in the late '60s when this happened, and recently has gotten some fame again because of. Um, documentary that came out recently. But I found this book, uh, it's called The Strange Last Voyage of Donald Crowhurst. And this is his boat, this is called the Time Mount Electron, and it's, uh, it's on the beach of uh, Cayman Brock. So anyway, long story short, he, um, he was, um, he wanted to become the first person to solo circumnavigate the Earth without stopping. Without stopping, and it was a, a long race that he was involved in called the Golden Globe, a very famous race in the in the late '60s. And but the thing with him was is he didn't really know how to sail. And he convinced he never left the English Channel, um, and he he so he had no open sea sailing experience. And he convinced a lot of people to spend a lot of money on him. He was a real um, convinced people. And, and he convinced himself, he tricked himself in some way, that believing that he could do this. And he designed this incredible boat, this, tri this fiber, uh, plywood and fiberglass trimaran boat called the Time Knock Electron, one of the first um, trimarans uh, that, were, that, was, that were made um, in, this, in this style. And he set sail and tried to, tried to do it. And he got into the Atlantic and it was just terrible. It was like the boat was taking on water. It was like it wouldn't sail straight. Like he didn't really know how to sail. Like it was like fittings were breaking, and he. But he kept trying and he kept trying. And you can see here, this is his sort of course where, where he went. And as he, as he got got into sort of the middle of the Atlantic, he realized. Um, well, he he lied about his course. He lied about where where he was, and. And it started out as kind of a small lie, where he he lied that day and believed that the next day he could make up for where he was because he was radioing back his his uh, his progress. 
And it didn't work out that way. And so he slowly, slowly kept telling people that he was farther along on his journey. He was racing around the earth on this heroic voyage. And meanwhile, he was sort of ghosting around the Atlantic. And he did that for about 260 days or so. And while he was doing that, he kept two log books. One, one that was real and one that was fake. And so one that was, one was the heroic voyage and one was his sort of like philosophical musings and slow kind of, um, uh, slow de-evolution into some like crazy existential despair. Until finally he, he jumped off the back of the boat, or so is believed. And his, the time out the uh, electron like, drifted into a shipping lane about 10 days after the last entry in his log book. And they boarded the ship and there was a mess and they found the two log books. And they took the boat to um, uh, Jamaica, the closest island. It was sold at, a, at an auction and quickly sold at another auction that ended up in Cayman Brock. And this book came out about it, The Strange Last Voyage. And, the, and it kind of became like infamous. And so I found, I, I found this story and it was kind of like pretty unbelievable. I needed to go down to see the boat and to think about what this object, what this object possessed, like if there was something there. And immediately when I saw that, I knew that I, that it was, that I needed to be in it in a different way. Like I had already kind of, um, I, I couldn't become a bigger fan of, of the story. Like I had already kind of like surmounted that, but I needed somehow to touch, to touch the, to touch this, this idea closer. So I took, I took about a year to try to find the owner of the boat that was beached and convince him to sell it to me. So I, I bought the Time Mouth Electron in 2007. And it was somehow about an idea of changing a relationship to, and this is a, I think this is a performative um, concept as well. It's like the way that one might change a relationship with an object. So there's a way that there's a way that by becoming a steward of something, and I wouldn't even count owning it. I mean, we could we could discuss about ownership, but would ownership ownership kind of bequeaths uh, stewardship, like that you you are you get to do something with this thing. You get to protect it. You get to preserve it. You get to do something with it. And it changes the whole psychic dimension of an object. And it was something um, that I was really interested in. This is another piece. These are pieces that I don't understand the audience to. Um, this is another piece. Uh, this is a, a piece for the Quebec City Biennial a few years back. Um, and in it, I bought 50 acres of, of land uh, about 17, 17 hours north of Quebec City. Completely, no one's, no one's there. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's forest land for, for being cut. It's forest land for paper and for timber. But somehow thinking about this land as a, again, in, in some kind of de-anthropomorphized kind of way, it's like you can see here the the, the land, it's the trees are planted on the grid, everything, even though there's no people there, the purpose of the land is, is very specified. It's, a, it's our fingerprints are all over the land, so it's, it's simultaneously like, like natural and wild and crazy, but also organized and like, like, it's a very strange relationship when you see it. And so somehow there's 50 acres of land that are, that are somewhere in Canada that are that have a different logic to them, that have a different that are being that are that are not being harvested and not being mined, that have a completely different reality around them, that are sort of returning back to a natural order, is um, and so that piece is held in perpetuity and no no one's really seen it before. Like the only photographs that exist are Polaroids. I guess um, there's just one more thing I'll say, and. Um, it has to do with um, it's a it's it's kind of a it has to do with the way that we can understand objects or under objects can understand us, and 
or how we can misunderstand things, how we can not fully, fully, um, fully possess the capacity to, to, to exhaust an object. And I was thinking about this one show. I think I have it here somewhere. I want to get to it. Here it is. So this is show in, this is a show in Berlin uh, a couple years back. And there is a group of objects there. This is the last piece I'm going to show. There is a group of objects that I placed in the space. And it was um, this kind of clay figure on top of a diesel generator. And then there was a stack of blankets here, uh, blankets from all over the world. And then the sh uh, shell and the meteorites, some objects that, that I had used in different ways before. So the vocabulary or something similar, and a few other objects. And so the objects were in the space, and something was wrong. And um, what I, w I knew that behind this wall, there was a faux wall that the gallery had built to hide two windows. And so I just cut into the wall and opened the window that was behind it. So you can kind of see this like rude, this kind of rude cut in this kind of window behind it. So I just opened the window. And immediately when the window, when the window opened, uh, everything changed. Like everything seemed to become right. The exhibition somehow started to congeal. And the, outs the idea of the outside came in somehow. Like this idea of like the, the, the notion of the outside somehow crept into the space. And as, as I was thinking about that, the idea of the outside, it literally came in the space. So there was this breeze that came in through the window. And I was sitting there, and it's like, it was pretty amazing. It's like, you could feel the breeze kind of like, like hit your body, like move your clothes a little bit. And you could feel the breeze kind of like, like penetrate the fibers of, of, your, of your shirt. And it, the breeze started to touch and caress your skin. And all of a sudden, I stopped feeling it. And I looked around. And I could see there was an object, there was a piece of fabric in the, in the show, and I could see this fabric moving. I couldn't feel it anymore, but I could see it moving. And I started to imagine the, the breeze in the room as somehow kind of enveloping all of the objects in the space. Somehow it was like caressing every single object in the space. And for me, it's, I, was calling, I was calling them what they were. I was like a piece of clay, um, fabric, um, meteorite from Argentina, uh, conch shell from Micronesia, um, blanket from Mexico, blanket from Mali, blanket from India, diesel generator from Germany, concrete floor, gold ring, like all of the things that, that I had understood, like the breeze had touched, but the breeze didn't have, doesn't have that intelligence, doesn't have that kind of intelligence, but it has this other kind of capacity, the way that it's sort of caressing and touching these things and understanding things about these objects that I could never, never understand. So there was some, there was some awesome moment when the outside came in, but also this idea of the breeze started to change the, the way in which uh, I started to understand uh, uh, the idea around intelligence and capacity and how intelligence isn't, isn't a flat thing. Okay, that's it. Thank you.